First time I heard Adora speak, I was transformed. I prepared to listen to a student and quickly understood I was learning from a teacher. How is this 15 year old, as of two days ago, in such high demand on the world lecture and classroom circuit? Since the age of four, Adora has been exploring what she can do with the written word. Everything from championing literacy and youth voice to raising awareness about world hunger as a youth representative for the World Food Program. Hoping to instill her love of learning in other children, she ta taught her first class at a local elementary school the first year her book, Flying Fingers, debuted. Since then, she has spoken at hundreds of schools, classrooms, and conferences around the world. She co-authored her second book, Dancing Fingers, a collection of poetry with her older sister, Adriana, in 2009. In 2010, she delivered the speech, What Adults Can Learn From Kids, at the prestigious TED Conference. That video received over 2 million views and has been translated into over 40 different languages. The National Service Association, National Education Association honored her with their award for outstanding service to public education in 2011. Most recently, Odora won the Women's Media Center's Girls State of the Union contest this year, delivering a speech to the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. that was introduced by notable feminist Gloria Steinem. Today, a junior in high school, Adora is continuing her advocacy work through frequent speeches, opinion pieces, and media appearances. When asked what advancing improvement in education meant to her, Adora shared that it was more than traditionally discussed topics like effective benchmarks, engaging curriculum, and equitable and educational access for all students. She said, improvement in education must fundamentally include greater empowerment for young people to realize that we can have a voice in our education and the ability to make a difference. Adora's key message is that giving young people a stage, a right, and a voice to become advocates and change makers not only empowers students, but also empowers teachers, administrators, and schools. Quote, reciprocity is the heart of learning and teaching, after all. Dedicated to spreading the joy of literature with others, she remains one of the youngest teachers in the world. Adora has traveled to more than 500 schools and classrooms worldwide, including China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and the UK, gaining the nickname Dora the Explorer, Explorer from the way she opens up the experiences of reading and writing to her peers. We are truly fortunate that Adora is exploring Texas today. Please help me in welcoming Adora Svitek. Hashtag on Twitter. 
Okay, who would like to go with option one? Um, I was hoping to issue some hall passes, you know. <laughs> option two. Seeing some raised hands. Awesome. I think that we, we know that we can, this is an amazing audience who will really be taking these responsibilities um, seriously and is going to be contributing to the discussion, hopefully. However, I also definitely encourage you, if anything ever gets boring, if you disagree with something, please be vocal about it. I want to see those thoughts on Twitter and I'd like to really address and get a conversation started. So, we have this hashtag. Who's on Twitter? Let's raise your hands. Okay. So for those of you not on Twitter, then what we're going to do is just head on over to Twitter. I'm going to log out so you can see the process of setting up an account. So, this is fairly easy. Go to twitter.com. So for those of you who already have accounts, why don't you just tweet out something with the hashtag. If you're new to Twitter, you just sign up with your full name. So, I already have one, but I can just use one of my other emails so I think this should work. And sign up for Twitter. Oh, oops, I already used that email. Okay. I have like four, and somehow I've managed to use them across all the social networks. But, <laughs> let me try to Oh, okay. It's, never mind. It's actually a lot easier than this as long as you have an email. Uh, how many people have successfully just registered? Has anyone done that? Okay. So, I'm going to go ahead and um, log in as one of, oh, this is probably what I used that email for. Okay, so. My TEDx Redmond Twitter account, this is the conference that I organize. Um, and what I'm going to do is say, so I can tweet out something like that. And now what you're going to see is when you search for the hashtag, up over here, then you'll be able to see a list of all the tweets coming in. And I'm hopefully going to see a few of yours. So here at the AIA conference, listening to Adora. Shout out to Alana. Yay, my first time. And I think that it should really inspire everybody how many first time people have just gotten on Twitter for this conference. I've heard some awesome stories. All right, so is anyone having difficulties with registering? Raise your hand. Okay, so you want to maybe talk to your neighbor and see if they can want some insight. Is, it, is the internet working okay? Is it everything loading? Pretty good? Okay. So as we move along, just um, make sure that you're on Twitter and for those of you who already have accounts that you can weigh in frequently. So now let's take a test drive. Use 140 characters to describe one innovative idea you've tried in your school district or a future idea that you would like to try. So one innovative idea. Make sure that you use the hashtag to ensure that your tweet will be seen. And if you're the lucky first person to complete a full tweet of this innovative idea, then I will give you a copy of my book. So, let's see these awesome tweets coming in already. So, innovative idea.
collected videos from hundreds of people across the world, all singing to the same song, and put it together in this very moving, beautiful rendition. And now, crowdsourcing is happening in the classroom and at conferences. I think it's all about unleashing the power of the people, which is pretty awesome. Now, in much of the same way, we can source some truly inspired ideas for change in education from students. Now, you might ask about the practicality of our hopes and dreams for education, considering that as students, we generally see one side of the classroom. We may not know necessarily about all the standards that must be met, the things that go on behind the scenes. I hope that the ideas that I'll outline seem practical, but I'll also be the first to admit, as young people, we're maybe a little bit naive, or maybe a little impulsive, or maybe a little impatient. But when I think about these things, I realize that they can be strengths and not weaknesses. It means that we have bright visions of impossible futures, which can give us the ideals we should strive for. And it means that we want to jump into action. It means we aren't content with simply waiting for the pace of change in entrenched systems. We want to see our hope justified and change embodied now so that both can become more than buzzwords. So where does advancing improvement in education fit into this? Well, allow me to tell you the story or the tale of two classes, if you want to make a pun, and a student's perspective on tests and learning. So to give a bit of background, as you know, I'm a published author and teacher. I write every day. I really define myself by the words I put on paper or publish online. And yours truly got an F on her first time to write an AP English Language and Composition. Because I failed, even in my gloriously awash with unnecessary historical detail analysis of the article to catch the one right answer, the rhetorical device that the rubric was actually looking for. Irony. That's right. I got a C plus on the multiple choice problem set, so a little bit better. Uh, the problem set that we did in class were practice for the test, and undoubtedly many of my classmates did way better than me, so if that doesn't put the whole prodigy thing to rest, I'm not sure what it is does. I'm like a little better than average, but I find certain other questions far more important than any of the lovely questions about rhetorical devices or style or tone. I ask myself, when we walk into class, are we learning skills that allow us to write novels? Do we consider ourselves writers? Do we have the chance to publish our work? And more importantly, do we love to write? This is the problem as I see it with our singular devotion to education's natural pastime, or as I clearly understand from the number of restrictions and benchmarks, et cetera, the necessity of students always making the grade on standardized tests. In the process of searching for the one right answer and helping students get there, we may forget about the things that aren't so easily measured on a bubble and sheet. If students know how to love learning and how to learn from failure when it happens, the risk of focusing solely on one goal I found is getting tunnel vision and not seeing what lies on the sides. But it definitely doesn't have to be that way. So at this point, I have A's in both my English language composition and my AP government class. But in Gov, the impending doom known as the AP test in May, and maybe not quite doom, it doesn't break down our necks in the same way uh, in the form of lots of practice sets or that frequent of references. In Gov, we do things like watch episodes of Northern Exposure or The Daily Show or The West Wing, actually relevant to government, don't worry. We discuss current events and the debates. We even discuss the validity of rankings on this list called In a Mass Knife Fight Between Every American President Who Would Win and Why. I highly recommend looking it up. It's very entertaining, and I also learned the important negative information that should such an event actually occur, you definitely want Andrew Jackson, Teddy Roosevelt, and George Washington on your side. <laughs> Is this going to help me get a five on the AP test? I don't know. Maybe when I'm sitting there and I'm staring at some question about federalism, I will somehow be reminded by this beautiful list. But is it a component of the exciting, passionate about government and history environment of this class that makes me excited to walk in there every day? Definitely. And to me, this helps evidence how worthwhile it is to take notice of those things on the side that maybe don't directly help us in the testing definition of improvement. To me, loving a subject naturally makes me more invested in wanting to improve there. So how do we find the time to innovate and cultivate students' love for learning while meeting standards? I'd love to hear your ideas on Twitter. So we have 24 new tweets, which I'm excited to read. You can use the hashtag on Twitter. 
So I'm saying, why do we limit the learning of our students by limiting their thinking, by limiting their use of technology? Why do we limit the use of the word limit? I would also like to ask that question. This is a beautiful example of where limit um, should be limitless. Um, I'm going to stop with limit now. Okay, so this actually is a great point. Technology is one of those things where you might say, well, it's a distraction. You know, if students are looking at the phone in the palm of their hand, they won't be looking at me or the teacher up in front of the class. If there's learning on that screen, does it matter whether they're looking at the person at the front of the room or the person next to them or what's in the palm of their hand? Interesting question to think about. So ideas as to how we innovate while meeting standards. Let's refresh here. There is no one right way. I think that's a very important philosophical point as well. Right here, share your inspirations. That's right, guys. I would love to hear you speak up. So let's get some innovative ideas going. Limits are part of calculus. That's the only realistic place for limits. I like that. In this fast-paced world, we also need to take time to just talk and connect eye to eye. I agree. I think that that is very important. And while it might sound like what I just said about staring at the smartphone or whatever device you have for learning, it might sound like I'm not advocating interpersonal connections. I truly do believe that those are uh, that, that that is one of the foundations of learning. That's another reason why I love my classes because I get to connect with the teachers and truly have a relationship. Students are more multitask writing than traditional teachers think they are. Yes, we are. If you have ever caught a student reading Tumblr, being on Facebook, instant messaging, texting, and doing their homework at the same time, yes. That's actually um, uh, an example that doesn't seem to predict well about um, what we'll be multitasking on. But I think that we can multitask on some really productive things as well. Sorry about the audio. Fear doesn't have to be what stops you. Channel the energy and don't be afraid to sail forward. This brings me to a really important point, actually, about how we make students really afraid of failure. When I got that F on my time to write, I was like, what just happened? Why did that happen? You know, this doesn't happen to people like me, and so on and so forth. And I feel like for students, especially who are used to not failing, or don't take it very well, but uh, that's something that we really have to realize that we can get over it and more importantly learn from our mistakes. How do we get our teachers to adapt their teaching as quickly as our students' learning changes? Ask students how they learn. What do we do when we go home and we want to learn something? How do we learn naturally and organically that we direct ourselves? I think that gives a lot of insight into how we learn when we're really driving. So to speak to that failure point, my first idea for uh, innovation while raising standards from the idea that actually, yes, failure is an option. This, oh my god, I cannot fail attitude propagated a lot of the times, a lot of the time by some really high stakes projects or tests or assignments where we're like, this is worth 100 points or so on. I think that that's actually detrimental because we really need to have a space where we can take risks, where we can make mistakes and learn from our failures before we face the spotlight of something as big as a standardized test. Otherwise, students will be wary of taking risks that may bring new learning. I'd love to see more practice with less stress attached, being able to simply write, discuss, engage with our classmates without fearing a big fat F. For instance, when I was younger, my mom set up this after-school program with teachers she hired to come and help my sister and me improve our writing skills. And one of my favorite assignments was something called becoming an expert. What we did was we would set up a blog, we picked a topic that we were passionate about, and we researched constantly, we wrote, we received comments from readers of our blogs, from our teacher, from our classmates. That was tremendously empowering because not only did it give me the chance to have a choice in something that I cared about, I picked the topic of ancient China and got to come up with some, and got to find some really interesting pieces of research, but it also allowed me to see that my work mattered, that other people were learning from something that I was putting out there. And for a student to become a teacher in such a way was one of the most empowering things ever. Now the fact that I didn't get graded didn't take away from my dedication to this project at all. In fact, I think that I improved based more on how strongly I 
felt then about the work that I was doing as opposed to thinking, am I going to get an A on this? Idea number two is we make learning relevant. You might say, well, learning, all of it's relevant. I agree with that to some extent, sure. Something that I learned about Shakespeare, I may not go and use it in a job, but it definitely is still relevant to me and it enriches my life. But relevance in another way uh, is something that we don't see necessarily all the time in school. We generally decry the concept of instant gratification, but it's really undeniable that it's ingrained in our lives, especially the lives of people of my age. It's silly, but probably any teenager on Facebook, and maybe some of you as well, when you post, you're sort of watching that notifications bar, you're like, is somebody gonna like it? Is somebody gonna like it? Do they care what I think at all? And you will pretend that you don't do it, but people want that gratification to see. Are people seeing this? Are people responding in a positive way? That's Facebook, and there are countless other places where we seek and receive gratification. But school has one of the longest wait times for it. Students here go through school, graduate, go to college, get a good job, there's your gratification. Well, 12 years and four years if you add on college, grad school, it's a pretty long time to wait when we're used to getting likes on a post on Facebook within seconds. Sure, we can and do argue that the knowledge you gain every year enriches your life right now. But when I think of learning and relevance, I imagine this situation. A student hands in a stellar paper. It moves you, it might even bring you to tears or make you laugh. Then what happens to that paper? The student gets an A, some awesome marks from the teacher. Well, sells everything on the rubric. And then it's crumpled up in a backpack or shoved into the shadows of a locker, never to be seen again. That moment right there, it's dramatic, but it marks the depth of possibilities for those words. Furthermore, it's the reason why some students don't try very hard. If they're not motivated by the idea of getting a good grade, and if they're not motivated by the idea of, I want to impress the teacher, or I want to make my parents proud of me with this report card, why should they put in the hours? We can lift students' work out of the shadows from the limitation of an audience of one or a few to the connection and reciprocal learning of an audience of many using technology. And idea number three is we give students voice, which I feel ties very much into number two. I'd like to hear what you think and what you know about student voice. What does student voice mean to you? How is it exemplified in your school district? What are some of the ideas you've heard from students, perhaps? So please tweet, you should be using the hashtag, which you should all know by now, A-I-B-C-O-N-F, about your definition of student voice. So, seeing some new tweets here. It is refreshing to get a classroom view of rules and expectations from the perspective of a non-disciplined student. Trying to understand the interpretation of non-discipline here. Um, seeing my mom tweeting a picture, Failure is an option to learn from mistakes. Failure with support is difficult for some teachers to understand. Failure is an option to stop trying is not. Very good point there. I think that when I say failure is an option, we're not saying to students, here's an F, be happy with it. It's, here's an F, how do I turn that into a motivation to jump over a hurdle instead of just a, hey, you didn't quite clear it. Yes, join the front row. Feedback for students' work is much more valuable to them than just a grade. Highly agree. Standards can be embedded in project-based learning that allows for creativity and student-directed learning. Also agree. I feel like projects give us students a lot more opportunity to have some voice and choice in what we're discussing, and there are at least some examples of some really great stories. To make learning relevant, teachers must have relationships with their students so they know what is important and inspire, for sure. And when we think also about student voice, for teachers to really talk to students directly and ask what's important to you, what are the issues you care about, do you know what's going on in the world, what are some of the things that you're passionate about in your community, asking questions like that, just taking a minute out of a day, you know, that can be incredibly valuable. Tweets are pouring in, glad to see this. Student voice is allowing students to set goals and supporting them as they work to meet their goals, great. Using Show Me app to publish math learning on the web, yay. And actually a lot of students, to the issue of student-created content, if any of you have seen mathtrain.tv, this is a perfect example of where student voice and student teaching intersect because this is a group of middle school kids who 
who have gotten online and are using their math skills to teach other kids and um, even kids like me about different math topics, pre-algebra and beyond. Allow students to have blogs, tweet, text with other students and their teachers to connect. Perfect example, really letting students connect in the same way that we are today. Making learning relevant is key for every subject we teach. How do we make math and science relevant for at-risk students? Awesome question. Anyone want to connect to Fernando's question? So when I think about that, I'm definitely seeing that there are so many applications for math and science in communities um, to the point of improving communities. I think I recall reading a story actually at some point about a school that really needed to um, fix, I think it was some issue in school architecture and some science students actually got together and said, hey, if we can figure this out, let's, I think it was like um, engineering a slant of uh, item in the, um, in the uh, connection between the roof and the wall or something. You can definitely tell I'm not such a science person, unfortunately, but the point of that example is that you can take students who have expertise on a topic or would like to develop expertise on a topic, give them a problem that has relevance to their life, whether it's at school, in the community, and say, hey, I challenge you to solve it. Student voice should be the offering of choices for demonstrating learning and the chance to defend, reflect, and revise that learning. Also, publishing student work makes it real and authentic. I couldn't agree more. Student voice gives them a chance to share their stories and find a connection to the learning and peers. Teachers' eyes are open. Student, one who simultaneously learns and teaches. Beautiful definition. Let's empower our students to become independent thinkers and learners. Use Twitter words that would help students learn to widow words and thoughts in writing. I love this one because I'm a tremendously verbose writer. There are few sentences I write that do not have like way too many words. And so when I first got on Twitter, I looked at it as a challenge to get as many gigantic words as I could into 140 characters. I believe there was one where I used Brobdingnagian or Brobdingnagian, one of my favorite words. I never know how to pronounce it. <laughs> and I think it was convoluted in the same tweet, which is kind of an impressive feat, in my humble opinion. <laughs> so, yes, that point. Great. Uh, great one. So, yeah, giving students voice, I think that it starts with suggestions as broad reaching, as specific, or as general as some of the things that you guys have just said. And I hope that you'll, you're seeing what your colleagues are saying and take notes because there are some really interesting, great ideas going on right now. Right now, I know that when I walk into school, I don't feel like I can just raise my hand and say to my teacher, hey, I would really like to have the opportunity for, with this assignment, to publish all of our work online so we could see feedback and stuff like that, even though that might be what I'm thinking. And I would be kind of scared to write an email to my principal or call her up or meet with her in person. I've never actually seen my principal face to face. But I would be a little bit scared to say, here's something that I see that I would really like to see changed at school. And probably a lot of other students can relate to that experience, where they feel a little bit detached from the people at school or the decision makers at the district level who might be able to change things and where they feel that they don't have a place where they can raise their voice or share their opinions. Independence and ownership in our learning is essential for critical thinking in the future. Yet when we think about the model of school as it currently looks like for most students, it's pretty sober to realize that it's still in many ways preparing us more to be obedient workers on an assembly line, as was you know, the point of education back when um, kids were still getting prepared for such realities most of the time, as opposed to really directly participatory citizens who raise their voices, who have decision-making input. Students are starting to change this. There's a social media movement, hashtag voice, and if you look it up, you can see some really awesome points going on. They have discussions every Monday, and really encourage students to weigh in. So there was a lot of discussion recently about the French president banning homework for students around the nation. I know a lot of American students were like, whoa, we moved to France. And there, was all the, there was also discussion on autonomy in the classroom, um, emphasis on testing, how the Brooklyn Public Library changed my life, so some really good things about out-of-school opportunities, working to establish the student voice culture, authentic perspectives bridge gap. So 
There are all these great examples of students starting the discussion and of it having an impact. Secretary Arnie Duncan actually met with the National Council of Young Leaders. This is the type of action I would love to see more of. This is innovation not only for schools, but also in how we think about young people and our role in schools. Because it's typically been said that we are represented, you know, that our parents, politicians, stakeholders of education go out there and represent us. But I feel like especially with my demographic high school students and even middle school students that we can really represent ourselves quite powerfully as well when given the opportunity. The issue we're discussing at today's conference is improving student performance. And I firmly believe that when given the chance, students don't need to be the problems in the sense of performance isn't good enough, this is stuff we really need to improve, et cetera. We can be the solution, we can help provide solutions. Another one of my rationales behind increasing the role of student voice in education, research, and decision making is the fact that it's hard to find any successful companies that don't value their most valuable assets, their people. And as we go about innovating in our approaches to education, we can invite students to the table really powerfully with things like Twitter, movements like student voice. And I'm going to show another example of something that I started, uh, the Facebook group, The Student Union, which I highly encourage you all to join and to encourage your students to join. So we have conversations, we talk about politics and relevance for education. Um, student is making a feature length film about standardized testing. And there are some really diverse issues, everything from uh, you know, the pretty polarized discussion on AP classes to how do you learn, um, how do you drive self-directed learning. And students talking about different opportunities they've had to go speak and where they've been able to raise their voice in an effective way. Giving us voice is more than hearing what we have to say. It's also giving us an opportunity to learn from leadership. When students have the opportunity to talk to other students, really collect their thoughts, present them in meaningful ways, they feel empowered. I know that when I took the action of starting the student union, of writing a letter to my school district school board about student voice, about speaking on stages like this about student voice, that this teaches me more than I could have ever imagined when I first started thinking about wow, students need to have a voice in education. So there's a tremendous amount that I've learned as a result of this and that I would love to see as an opportunity for other students. Now I've heard people say sometimes, well, but you're a prodigy or you're different, you're special, most students don't really care that much. And I firmly disagree. For one thing, most prodigies don't get that much time to write. Just kidding. But I think also that the students that I know, my classmates, whether they're in regular or AP classes or would consider themselves activists on issues or that they don't really care, we all care about our education because we go to school every day. And when there's something that we don't like or when there's something that we really love and would love to see more of, we want to be able to have a voice in that. So I'm seeing some new tweets. Agreed, I've tried this year with some success, still trying to improve the class Facebook page. So this brings me to a really cool idea, which would be starting a student voice page for your class. So what you can do is just create a group, and you could call it, say, the student voice page at, uh, someone want to throw out a name of a high school. Amarillo High. Awesome. So I'm going to add some people to the group. They'll be very confused, but I'm going to add my dad, my, uh, my sister, and my mom, because you know, people will get it. So you can make it closed, or you can make it secret for some privacy concerns. You might want to make it secret, and you can go ahead and create this group. So what you would do here is you would add some students. They could be responsible as leaders. They could add their friends and their classmates. Would wait if you select an icon here. So you get a skateboard. Really that simple. And then what you can do is you can ask a question. So for instance, if you were to give a speech at the Advancing Improvement in Education Conference, what would you say? So I can post that. And then what can happen is the student will go ahead and comment and they'll say something. I can also ask a question. And this is a great way to really bring out the voices of students who 
might not be as outspoken, who might not feel comfortable sharing their opinions so directly. And you could say something like, uh, what do you think is the trait your favorite classes have in common? I'm sure you can come up with some better questions, which is what I'm going to talk about and add some options and allow students to add options so they can come up with things and you'll get a really interesting conversation going. So you might say, well, my school district doesn't allow Facebook for some students are not Facebook, whatever it may be. That's totally cool. You can do this on a school website. You could do this on a private class page. You could set something up with Google Docs that allows you to make surveys for students and where they can also have free response options. You can do this in a lot of different ways. However you do it, ensuring that there are connections going on, where students can really talk to their peers, and where you have an authentic conversation. So, what are some of your other ideas for connecting with students? Students would be far more involved if they knew their voice mattered, right? I think that a lot of students also ask themselves, well, I might say something, but will anyone really hear? Will anyone take it seriously? And so I've been tremendously privileged to be able to speak at education conferences, and I know that a lot of other students or envious in the sense that they hear about teachers hearing these things and they say, wow, they actually take this seriously. And that's something that I am tremendously grateful for every day. So, we have one new to me. Student Advisory Committee helped us develop our BYOT and helps keep us focused on how to meet their needs. Also, setting up a Student Advisory Committee is a perfect way to go about getting student voice. One other point, so people would say, well, you're different, exceptional, etc. Don't limit the people on a student advisory committee or who you're asking questions about the educational experience to just the students that are making great grades, who love school. You can get some really good ideas from at-risk students, from students who may not be engaging with their school communities as much, from students in special education, from students experiencing a whole range of problems, possibly uh, connecting them to school, asking them, hey, what does your ideal school look like? What would you do if you were principal for a day? All kinds of questions to really get their ideas. I think that it's valuable to ensure that students realize all voices truly are equal and deserve to be heard. Now, students um, walk into school and they can see a learning environment that's really created directly by our teachers, principals, superintendents, and the, be the best or the most amazing education leaders, I feel, aren't just amazing education leaders. They're creators of this environment of passion about learning. They evince that passion every day, and as a result, so do their students who look up to them. In the best classes, how much you've learned isn't defined by the grades you have. Rather, it's the questions you ask, how much you're invested in your learning, how you are as a citizen of the learning community. When we're motivated too much by an artificial measure, like the grade that we get, instead of a real motivation to improve and learn, I think that there are problems. So I'd love to hear your ideas or experiences around creating this learning environment. How do you go about doing that so that students truly feel passionate? Integrating technology. Uh, poll everywhere to survey students is a great one back at the top of the student voice. And by the way, guys, I understand there's a little bit of a delay because you know, you're fighting with Wi-Fi and stuff. That's totally cool. So, Ideally to me, when I think about a learning environment, I would love to see something that breaches the walls of the classroom and allows us to connect to the world. School often seems like a bit of a bubble. When I walk into school, I turn everything off. You know, I don't want Facebook, don't want Twitter, don't want Tumblr, don't want Reddit, etc. We don't really connect with people outside of our immediate vicinity, sometimes even our classmates or our social group. Imagine the school, instead of a bubble, as a gateway, a bridge, a portal. Imagine the possibilities technology provides. Even if you're in a classroom where a teacher has just one computer available to provide um, to the students, then you could do a group Skype session with an expert, like an author or a zookeeper or astronomer. You could post class updates on a blog shared with a sister class in another city, state, or country as a way of, as, as a way of connecting with other schools. Whatever the embodiment of global connection, it's imperative that we break down these walls to show students you can do this in your own life using technology. I worked with Google and the Family Online Safety Institute to develop a series of videos called Teach Teachers Tech. And one of my videos focused on virtual field trips. Let's take a look. Hey, I'm a I 
still remember how thrilled I was to go on my first field trip and how excited my classmates and I still get at the prospect. After all, who doesn't like to travel? Far away places can give us a sense of awe and wonder. But actually, going somewhere isn't always an option. Taking a trip inside a 21st century classroom, though, is just a click away. With as little as a single download, we are equipped with instant wings and a bird's eye view. With the UNESCO World Heritage Down for Google Earth, you can explore the world virtually, going everywhere from Stonehenge to Notre Dame. Google's art project opens up the world's art to us. Now we can roam the halls, literally, of museums around the world, even after hours. One thing these tools have in common, they allow you to break down walls. We're no longer limited to learning only in the physical space around us. I find that ultimately liberating, because it teaches all of us lifelong learners that the world is the best classroom of all.
about Ted? Raise your hand. Okay, so Ted stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design, and it's a big conference that happens every year in California. Speakers like Bill Gates, Al Gore, etc. And these independently organized versions. This one was all about young people. They happen all around the world. And the 20 teenagers on our planning committee worked hard to bring together all the elements that you might imagine for a really massive conference. We had over 1,000 people in attendance. It was our biggest yet. It's been happening for three years, so it was a pretty big deal. We engineered social media and scholastic outreach, created speakers for the event, liaised with sponsors, filmed the whole thing, dealt with logistics. My mom did help uh, quite a bit as well. But I know about passion for students and investing in real world challenges because of experience at TEDx Redmond and how hard I worked on it. I never got a grade. Most of my teachers didn't actually know about the event until like the day before. But I would say that I learned more valuable lessons from this crazy, totally consuming experience of countless emails, leadership, last minute crisis management, speaker and sponsor, and speaker parents relations, and working with community than I had in an average year of any class. Don't get me wrong, I love school. But I know that the young people in our audience were inspired and empowered by this experience that, if only for a day, made them believe in the most gritty, real world, un Disney way that dreams really can come true. One of my favorite poems on that note is Langston Hughes' A Dream Deferred, which some of you might have read before. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a race in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and shiver over like a syrup of sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? I find this relevant to education, especially when I look back on this amazing opportunity that I've had to organize TEDx Redmond for three years, and I contrast that with the typical experience of most students. Young people are overflowing with dreams to burn. We hear everywhere, from pop culture, from parents, from schools to make a difference, help our families, follow our passions, even shape the world. Yet we see few obvious chances to do so. The work that you do every day helps a multitude of people. Your teachers need your support to effectively teach. Your students need you to feel safe and welcome in the schools. Parents rely on you to provide good educations for their kids to ensure the brightness of our futures. You get up and go to work because you know that the work that you do has impact. Your work makes a real difference in people's lives. Now imagine for a moment that your work was never seen or reviewed by more than one person and recycled soon after that person said, good job, or this wasn't that great, sorry. Without the opportunity to feel any impact in your work, would you have the motivation to go on day after day or find much meaning? Yet this is the reality of the students face. What we do in school stays in that bubble, relegated to the shadows of the locker or the backpack. So what's a 15-year-old girl with a burning desire for her work to matter to do? I think we deserve a chance for our work to matter. And it doesn't have to be with something as big as speaking on a conference stage or organizing one necessarily, although I think that those are amazing opportunities. You can start with a petition in a classroom. Hi, I'm Dora Sweetop. History teaches us that passion inspires collaboration. Just look at any successful movement for change. We can bring that same passion to the classroom by using online tools that facilitate activism. I'd love to imagine getting the assignment to start a movement. That would be pretty epic. Change.org is a great place to start. It's a site for individuals and groups to post petitions for pressing issues they believe in. Many success stories have come from students on Change.org. Three teenage girls successfully called for the first female moderator of the presidential debates in 20 years. A fourth grade class in Massachusetts led Universal Studios to launch environmental partnerships around their promotion of the Lorax. And students in Sun Valley School in California asked Crayola to start recycling its markers, receiving over 80,000 signatures on their petition. In all these examples, the students had the chance to interact with a real audience and spark action on a real issue, a perfect example of collaborative learning. There are plenty of roles for everyone, researching the issues, writing the content, and looking at the ways of raising awareness and gaining support. These are all things that help us become great learners. 
You have the chance to learn from our peers, think critically, and practice good digital citizenship. So, you might look at that and wonder, well, this could be a bit of a problem because we have to avoid any issues that might be political or divisive in a classroom, but they definitely don't have to be. If you saw those, those are pretty unobjectionable things. I mean, calling for a woman moderator in the presidential debates, that's something that I think a lot of people can rally around. If you give students a chance to do something like this, then they see how a real world impact get tens of thousands of signatures, change something. I think that that is more motivating than an A or an F or any other kind of feedback, to tell the truth, because you're really seeing the failure or success in a real world way. In my case, I'm only here today because the adults in my life took my dreams seriously. I guess I'm spoiled to expect that in a sense, knowing now that that's the exception more than the norm talk to a lot of my classmates and friends. But when I walked up to my mom and said, I want to publish a book, I didn't hear a wait until you're older. I persisted in calling up school after school, asking for the opportunity to teach fellow students about reading and writing until I finally found a school that was willing to hear what I, as a diminutive seven-year-old, had to say. And I had the chance to speak at TED in California because I was believed if they thought maybe this midget of a 12-year-old actually has something valuable to hear. I'm living proof of the possibilities when young people are given chances, aren't told that having an impact is something that you grow up to do. I'm wondering if in our goal of making young people realize the importance of going through high school, getting to college, making sure that they have a job, etc., that we've forgotten the fact that we can get other things done along the way. Going to school and making a difference should not be consecutive, but parallel. There's nothing wrong with the instant gratification of applying something you've learned in a real-world setting in a tangible way that evokes a response or helps your community or turn a profit. And this helps to address a fundamental issue of student performance, which is what happens when students aren't motivated by grades, when they just don't care about them. So give us something realer than grades. Give us life. I know that my writing did get better because of multiple choice problem sets or endless time rights. My writing got better because of practice in the School of Hard Knocks, aka a blog. When I was very young, I actually got started on typing up stories and poems and essays on my laptop. And so while other kids filled in blanks on worksheets, the teachers at our after school program taught us about forms of government by setting up a dictatorship in class, and then we as students organized and to talk when our teacher left the room and overthrew her. This might not sound like a typical classroom experience for most seven to ten year olds. It wasn't, and I think that's what was so awesome about it. We had the chance to do something like that, set up an imaginary country, organize a coup d'etat, write an article and some opinion pieces in response to it, post it online. It was a perfect example of teaching without blinders on. That is, focusing on the broad goal of creating an environment of dedication to learning and real passion for it, not just raising our test scores. Just as writing on a blog and receiving comments from others helped me improve my writing in a really expedient way, because I cared about what my audience thought about me, I wanted to make sure I would write stuff that made them proud. Students will invest more in learning when there is an option to have an impact to an audience available. Students in Arizona were challenged by their teacher to pick an issue that was a relevant school of community and science related, found this really interesting topic, which is that of buffalo grass. And some people live in Arizona might have heard of this one. They came up with the buffalo wrap.
then we can use something typically regarded as negative, like peer pressure, to provide that motivation as well as a really strong investment with teachers. I have a great Romeo and Juliet student interpretation video. Awesome there. So, we see with something like the Muffle Wrap that a group of students, regular middle school students, were just given this challenge by a science teacher to come together, work on an issue. They also started a Facebook page and sent it out to all their friends. Advancing improvement in education really does start with something like changing an environment and widening our focus. I understand the necessity of what everyone in this room is probably trying to do, which is to get students to perform better on tests and assignments and really invest themselves in school, but the questions that we're asking shouldn't just be limited to multiple choice questions, but students to answer. The questions that we should all ask ourselves should also include, do students love to come to school every day? Do they have love and appreciation for their learning? Are they moving towards self-directed learning, as I know is a theme a lot of people brought up? Do our schools break down walls through global well connections? Do we give students the chance to set into motion their hopes and dreams using their learning for tangible impact? Are students leaders, and do I give them the chance to teach as much as we teach them? I ask these questions because sure, we have accountability to parents, we have accountability to politicians, but first and foremost, the amazing adults in this room have accountability to the students who sit in these classrooms each and every day. And we're all accountable for the future. There's no education department grant that rewards a student's success 20 years down the road or something as difficult to quantify as a teacher who likes the spark of learning in a kid. But that makes those things no less worthy, no less significant, and no less worthwhile striving for every single day. I didn't mention something in the beginning of my talk, and you guys will be able to tell. That's how much of this speech has just been totally improvised. Although I've given hundreds of speeches, this is the very first one where I've ever crowdsourced so much and dared to take a risk to such an extent. You all are the best judges of whether this has succeeded or failed, but I'm so thankful to all of you for taking this risk along with me and answering the questions on Twitter, sending in your feedback and ideas, which are all incredibly creative. You might also wonder why I dare to take this risk when I could have just written a standard video speech and memorized it. Well, I wanted this talk to accurately represent how I felt about teaching and learning. And I realized something as I was brainstorming ideas, which is that learning isn't about memorizing something and reading it off for other people to also memorize and take notes and tell somebody else later and rinse and repeat. Learning is communicating. Learning is participating. Learning is exchanging ideas and thoughts. It's reflecting, expanding one's sense of wonder, increasing one's curiosity, and expanding your sense of possibility. Learning is addicting. When I truly shut my eyes and I visualize advancing improvement in education, I imagine a classroom where students don't start packing up two minutes before the bell, where we want to stay and continue the discussion debate and investigation, where we want to work more on our petition, get more signatures, where we want to continue editing that video. I imagine a day when school is the last place we want to leave and the first place we want to come day in and day out. I want a school that's a bridge to the world instead of a bubble apart from it. Not just a proven ground for our capacity to remember facts and numbers, but a place where ideas are born and our dreams come true. For all these wishes, you can call me unrealistic, idealistic. You can call me naive, you can call me prudent. But as the author Pearl Buck said, the young do not know enough to be prudent, and therefore they attempt the impossible and achieve it generation after generation. Thank you.